All right. Hello, everybody. It is 1230. So I will go ahead and get this presentation started. Um, I will be doing a quick introduction um, and housekeeping stuff um, before we get to the presentation. Um, so thank you guys all for attending. Um, the NNP Symposium is fully funded by the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society. Um, so super grateful for that um, and thankful for the opportunity to bring you guys a lot of cool speakers, um, all for free from the comfort of your home. Um, and a few yeah, housekeeping things before we introduce the speakers. Um, there is a Q&A session at the end of this. Um, and on the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Um, so you can go ahead and um, put your questions in there throughout the presentation. Um, and I'll facilitate a Q&A at the end um, with Ron and John. Um, so as you have questions, feel free to put them in there. Um, they'll be addressed at the end. Um, and this will be recorded, so you can always find it on the NNP Symposium website. Um, yeah, you can view all the all the previous videos, and this video will be available um, in roughly three weeks um, from Saturday after the symposium. So I will go ahead and introduce our speakers for the hour. Um, and Ron and John, if you want to unmute yourselves um, and turn your video on, you can do that. If you need any assistance, I can help with that. Awesome. I see you, John. Um, and so these two guys, uh, we have John Konauer and Dr. Ronald Gemmel. Um, they'll be talking, as you can see on the screen, um, about facts and misconceptions concerning the medallic issues during Lafayette's 1824 to 5 visit. Um, they're very knowledgeable on the topic, um, written several articles and books um, on this exact topic. So they are perfect people to give um, this presentation. And I'm sure we will all learn a lot about this topic. Awesome. I see you guys. Um, and so I will let you guys take it away from here. Okay. Okay, there's, we'll start off with looking at the, what people, the most familiar examples of these. The most familiar is the Washington Lafayette counter stamp. It comes on copper and silver. Then we have the Washington Lafayette metalette, which, which is, was done in silver. And then the one, the oval medallion was one that kind of upset the apple cart and actually got us on the, on the way to look at exactly what was going on with these things. These were the ones that were described in the New York Evening Post uh, ads uh, referenced by, by by John Kleberg and uh, it was not the counter stamps, it was actually the oval metal ads. So how many of these things are there? We've looked at well over 6,000 auctions on NNP and other sites. And we found five oval medallions, 25 Washington Lafayette medallettes, two of which are uniface. There's also six 8.6 millimeter small uh, medallettes. And we've got a few little pictures here to give some idea what these are. Then the uh, uh, the next, the third most numerous, or second, third most numerous was the Par Noble Fratrum medals. We found 19 of those. Then an interesting sort of subset of all this was the Blanding castings. Uh, William Blanding was a was a naturalist who kind of liked to make his own stuff, and he's actually more remembered for the for uh, having a turtle named after him. Then the 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 counter stamps themselves, we found forty. There were nine on half dollars and uh, one on a dime, a half dime and a quarter, and a half cent. There's we found eight Lafayette only counter stamps, and they're there was very various and sundry kinds. I didn't include them all here. This just gives you an example of them. Okay, now the big question is who made them? Right now, it depends on who you ask. For If you ask Kleberg and a lot of other people, they'll say Joseph L. Lewis did it. Neil Massani recently said he believes that Lewis did the oval medallions and possibly Generino Persico did the counter stamps. And, and metalettes and that they were struck at the mint. John Pack in the, in the Sid Martin sale voice that he didn't think it was Lewis. He thought it could be right, possibly Christian Goldbrath. Gamble and Konar think it's none of the above. And, and we're gonna tell you why based on what we think we've uncovered and put into proper perspective. Before we go any further, there's a fact that I think people have to understand. I'm not sure how well understood it is, but the 
And that is that all dice sinkers were engravers, but not all engravers were dice sinkers. And we'll give you some examples of that. Lewis was an engraver. He, he, he really engraved utilitarian objects, door knockers, that sort of thing. Asher B. Durand was a very skilled engraver who actually became a painter. His paintings sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. John, St uh, John Stout, he was an engraver, did utilitarian objects, spoons, that sort of things, and maps. Generico, Generico Persico was an artist and a lithographer. Luigi Persico was a sculptor who actually did, a, did an engraving for the Mint, and we'll talk more about that later. And Peter Maverick was sort of the first of the bunch. He was an engraver and later a lithographer. And as far as dice sinkers, Trested, Bell, and Wright were all engravers and dice sinkers. Okay, the four things we think that were wrong with Dr. Kleberg's logic was the adver the advertisements themselves. We think that basing a, a conclusion on an advertisement uh, about who made something, it's like saying that your local, uh, the local car dealer manufactures Ford and Chevrolets. The other thing is the lettering on the Erie Canal metal not not being done by right, we figure it, or we, we don't see that as an issue at all because it's a well-known fact. Richard Trested did that, and it's well chronicled in 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 Colden's memoirs from the from the Erie Canal work. The Lafayette buttons is it's not like the metal it was done for a different purpose. We don't really think it pertains to this argument. And finally, part of the rationale was it couldn't be couldn't have been done by right because there was uh, no signature. Well, then the obvious question is, where's Lewis's signature? Now, M Musani recently gave a presentation, some early work of dice sinker and metalist Charles Cushing Wright to the ANS. He acknowledged that the counter stamps were not the items in Cle Kleberg's presentation, and we obviously agree with that. He said the initial reference to the metalette was in McCoy's sale. May 1864, lot 2626. He did discount McCoy's attribution to Wright. We'd like to point out that McCoy was actually a contemporary Wright, as were several other people. Now, we prepared a, a timeline here of various people who had sales in the, in the late 1800s and, and, so, and other people involved. And what we have here is the, the blue lines are the lifespans of these people. The square box is where their lives overlap. And the small box is where their working careers actually overlap. Now we think that it's more than a real possibility and a very all and very likely that these guys, if they didn't know each other, they knew of each other. And here's some early examples of attributions to write that Ron had prepared. And I doubt if it's a complete list, but there's it's multiple listings where Wright was given credit for this for the counter stamps. Now, M Masani in his presentation believes that Lewis did the oval medallion. He based that solely on, on Kleberg's reasoning and called it a great job. What we found, in fact, there's no evidence whatsoever that Joseph Lewis ever sunk a die in his life, as far as we can tell. Even when he wrote Jefferson, you know, trying to give one of these away, he didn't actually claim that it was his work. Masani also stated that Conar Gamble conclusion was based solely on the oval, oval shape of the boulevard metal. What he said was a kind of based their assumption on this oval semo boulevard metal because it's an oval, I guess. Well, the whole purpose of including and referencing the oval boulevard metal was to show that Richard Tresser actually could do a, port, a, a metal with a portrait on it, even though he was well known as being for more for his uh, lettering than anything else, he could do portraiture. Musani also offered that the counter stamp dies were most likely the work of Generico Persico. Now, what we have here is a, the area in black here is a screen capture from his presentation. It shows a counter stamp on a on a on a silk for a half a dollar. It's from lot 15 of the Long Acre sale. And uh it it says it includes a counter stamp half dollar shown above with the following comment. Struck during the visit of Lafayette to Philadelphia, very fine, extremely rare. Dies were for those medallions, the dies for those medallions and counter stamps were most likely the work of Generico Persico, who had prepared a, a bust of Lafayette. The dies for the counter stamps and medallets were almost certainly the, his work and struck at the mint during Lafayette's visit. 
sometime after that, after he, they left the mint, the metal that's shown on the earlier slide were struck after the fact. We've also included the original auction catalog reference to the metal at block 515. We think that this slide's really sort of misleading and we don't believe it's actually correct. Generico Persico was an artist and a lithographer. He was a brother of E. Luigi Persico. We saw any refer Dave, reference Dave Bowers at, uh, for the Persico connection. In fact, Bowers referenced E. Luigi Persico who was paid to do a design of, of Liberty for the Mint. And what you have here next is the uh, July 18, 2000 reference by Bowers to that. And we we kind of wonder if maybe the fact that it said silver coins is why that was maybe thought that it was done uh, by by Persico. However, the, the quote itself it eliminates Generico and raises the questions. We we don't really understand where where Neil got the idea that Persico did the dies. Just what did Persico design? This here is an ad from the Philadelphia Inquirer via the National Gazette that discusses the metal in detail. It shows, it shows that it was actually a rendition of Liberty and that the, the dies were turned over to, to uh, William Neese, who was the chief engraver of the men at that time. It was clearly not a portrait of Lafayette or Washington. He further stated that he, that he says, I think these came out of the US Mint in Philadelphia. And here again, we referenced the screen capture. Now we tried to verify, but without success, uh, we contacted the National Archives and Records Administration, and, a, and one of the archivists there sent us a letter back that he could find no evidence that Lafayette had visited the Mint. But even if that's true or not true, that when you really start looking at what really happened at that time, Lafayette didn't get to Philadelphia until the 28th of uh, September, 1824, and it'd be very likely that he would have gotten to the Mint for at least a day or two for all the hoopla and stuff that went on when he when he got to Philadelphia. But even regardless of that, there was an ad in the newspaper for the sale of Washington Lafayette medals on uh, September the 24th, 1824. We think maybe the most convincing evidence that the counter stamps were not made at the men is the quality of the manufacturer of the counter stamps themselves. The quality was quite poor. 90% had some sort of defect, some sm relatively small, but it was either in the location of the counter stamp or the quality of the die. And we think that this fa these facts uh, suggest that, that they were made more in an on-demand situation and not in any controlled continuous production environment that you would have at a, a facility like the Mint. Secondly, we did some technical studies uh, to look at the movement of the, of the designs on the coins and on, on, the, on the metalettes and on the counter stamps themselves. And uh, we think that that study shows that the, that movement in, was more consistent with the fact that they were made with a hinge type die. The work we did, we actually took and measured on all the ones that we that showed movement is where the uh, where the uh, the head on the counter stamp moved around the coin, and the these bars, the outer bars here show that movement. And it was not, and it was very, very substantial and very obvious on a lot of the coins. Now, when we looked at the metal, that was a little bit tougher because it, it was, you know, the, the fact that you were putting the counter stamp on a coin essentially were you were measuring the run out of, uh, of the counter stamp. But on the on the metal, that's what we did is we looked at the we put a quadrilateral around Washington and then measured the movement of the of the cent of the center of the uh, of the quadrilateral. So what you have over here on the right. Is the solid lines is the movement of the uh, of the of the of the die on the coins. The dashed line is the movement of the of Washington's head on the uh, metalette. Now, also when we did lettering lettering comparison stuff, the lettering appeared to be consistent between the counter stamp and the die, or the counter stamp and the metalette. A final point in Musani's presentation is that. He said sometime after they left the mint that the metalettes uh, shown on were, were struck after the fact. We don't really agree with that unless he was applying they were struck after the silver 
silver counter stamps where we, we actually have kind of some opinion that silver counter stamps may have been the first one struck. The, the whole evolution of the medallions, medalettes, and counter, counter stamps was a transitional product, process, and the medalettes do not fit at the end of that chain. Now, we base this on the, on the production process was continually simplified. It was done for cost, what we feel were cost-cutting reasons to improve outfit, output and facilitate production. The workmanship appeared to drop off through all the phases of production, as we can see with the 90% error rate on the counter stamps. We also have recently begun to, to consider whether the oval medallion itself may have actually been made on a screw press. And, we, and we're kind of basing that on the fact that the suspension loops appear to be integral to the to the planchet and not added, as was the case with the metal X. And we know Treston and Wright had access to a screw press. They used um, one from Maltby Pelletro to do the uh, uh, Erie Canal metal. Also, the raw materials went from gilded silver to silver to copper. So there was a transitional manufacturing process, if you will. Now, an important point we want to make about Lewis, however, is that based on his business acumen, the circumstances of the times, and the proximity of those involved in, 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 in making these um, counters, uh, the, the medalettes and the counter stamps, that he was the driving force behind the distribution of the oval medallions. And we, I think with, this was in the first presentation we made a few months ago, this this whole area here of where uh, Lewis had his shop and the the engravers had theirs was very very close together. In fact, uh, several of the of the medalists or the the engravers and and Lewis were within a hundred acre circle. So you had a combination of proximity, resources, and that sort of thing. And in uh, Lewis is 39 years in business. The only time he took out an ad for, for the new in the New York City Directory was in uh, June of 1824, and this is a copy of the ad. We think that was done to, to set the stage for the distribution of the, uh, of the of the of the of the oval medallions. Now, the other thing we started to take a long look at was a professional relationship between Crested, Bale, and Wright. We think it's long been overlooked. And we think the, the its importance is very integral to understanding how the the medallions, medallettes, and camp counter stamps came to be. Trested was probably the most overlooked die sinker of the third decade of the 1800s, and it was likely due to his premature death. He died, I think he was like 36 or 37 years old. He died from an infected finger, and after he died, uh, Bale and uh, Wright bought his. Uh, inventory. The, the triangle on the next slide is a pictorial presentation we put together uh, to show that cooperative relationship. And that relationship was really, we was the driving force behind how we started to try to put together what really happened. Okay, this is the, uh, the triangle that we show with Trested, Wright, and Bale. This shows cooperation between Wright and Trested. Of course, Bale was, uh, was Trested's uh, worked for, for Trested for many years. And then, of course, Wright and Bale formed a partnership. And then we show the medallion stuff is uh, uh, in the center here. So where are we? We think we need, you got to go look at the metals and stuff that the, that these guys made. Uh, we'll look at what, what's been attributed to Wright, Trested, and Bale. They show many similarities in, design, in the design elements that are seen in the medallions and the, and the metalettes and the counters counter stamps. They also demonstrate that these, these die sinkers were skilled engravers. And here is a, here is a, a, a montage of, of the various things they've been, they've been uh, credited with doing. Here's the trust, trusted Simon Bolivar medal. This is a copy of Canoy's medal that Bale made. Then we have the, uh, some medals that Wright and Bale did together, plus the several Washington uh, medals that were made by Wright. There were more than that. And we also took the Paranobili Fractum metal in reverse Washington to show that even once you reverse it, it has several of the characteristics that you see in these other ones. 
So what we really think happened is, Tre is Lewis con contracted with Tress and Bell to make the oval medallions. At some point, Wright was called in and they came up with the uh, design for the Washington Lafayette medalettes. We think Washington was probably added to add longevity to uh, try to add longevity to the to it for sales after the the uh, Lafayette went back to uh, to uh, to uh, France, and then of course the the dies for the medalettes were used to make the counter stamps. Okay, so we built a this conclusion and attribution on the following: the circumstances of the time, which we talked about, the cooperative efforts known between Treston and Wright, observed similarities in the metal and designs of the parties involved, and the lettering, particularly the metal and the lettering similarities between the opal medallions and the metalette. That lettering essentially overlaps. This was called, it's been called to attention a couple of times, I think once by John Krelovich in one of his ads, and maybe by Bowers, I'd have to go back and look. But the, when you go and look at that, they, they almost overlap exactly. So how does this fit? If you look at a, this whole thing as a developmental type process that we talked about, you have, you know, you have co a concept, design, production, distribution, and sales, and you can tie people's names and, and what happened with, with each one of these. And you got, you have the networking and you have Wright, Tress, and Bale doing design and production. And you have Lewis uh, essentially putting together the, uh, the, uh, the idea, the product for the, oval medallions. So when you then when you look at like for example the Erie Canal metal, you have essentially the same thing, just different people. And this is the Erie Canal metal was it was was described in great detail on how it was made in Ted Wallader Colden's memoir for the Common Council that he wrote very long detailed article for a book about about the Erie Canal metal. So we think that the when you look at this in the context, an overall type context, the, what we presented here makes reasonably good sense. Okay. Now we also have a, a book in the works, and we'd like to at least we'd like to show that as we go. I got to bail out of this. Okay. Okay, is it up there, fellas? Not yet. Pardon? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. Oh, I got to hit the chair button. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. The, so the book. This is uh, uh, what we write have now right now for the front and back cover. Uh, just you know, shows the back cover shows the Lafayette's uh, route through the countryside. Okay, and here again we'll we'll recap what what we showed here, but we have, we also have sections on rarity and and uh, more details on that. This here in the table of contents, you see right now we have uh, roughly 18 chapters and a, a fairly extensive appendix, which we'll look at in a minute. We go into great detail on uh, on all these we could find. We Wherever we could find pictures, we've included. Uh, and we've also come up and, and given them numbers, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. What the Lafayette metal ads is the same. It's it'll be a that's about a 20, 25 page just uh, of of all the metal ads that, that were were made and we found. Also the same for the counter stamps. There's a section on die strikes and anomalies. And you can see that you get it, it's very illustrative illustrative of the uh, of the if you want to call it poor quality here, you can see that it was not uh, struck near hard enough and the outlook of the matron head is still on with Washington, as is the le the lettering from the coronet on the uh, on the matron head, and uh, on the reverse, it uh, one cent has not been obliterated, and even on and this is really nice when on a, one of the higher grades grade ones you can see the one cent uh, shows through. And then we have a error summary, and we'll have more detail on on what all the defects were. Now. We came up with a naming convention here where we 
assign a number to each one of them, and then the orientation of Washington and Lafayette. And the reason we assign the numbers is to try to, there's, there's you know, all together, there's probably a hundred of these things if you go back and add up. So there's not really that many of them, but we think we could put a number tracking on this. It'd be easier to track them, track them in the future, you know, as they come up for auction. But if you go back now, it's it's sometimes very difficult to try to figure out which one's which. We also have various, uh, this is a different uh, uh, timelines we make. We, we've prepared several of those. This here shows the various companies that were involved with uh, Durand and Maverick and Bale and Wright and Durand. And the, that got to be fairly, fairly, uh, you had to really watch what you're doing on which Durand, right? Right, was working for at what time? We have a fairly extensive appendix where we go in to provide a lot of backup details for uh, for what we have in, in in the various chapters of the book. One of those, and we think is extremely interesting, is the loops. And this is where we started looking recently at uh, perhaps the uh, loops on the oval medallion being the whole thing maybe being done by a by, by a screw press because they look integral to the to to the to the product. Now, if you go to the metal X, they're they're clearly been a, these loops have clearly been attached. In fact, if you look here and here, you can actually see the coin with the ring around. And I think Ron had, had has one has I think he purchased the Martin one and he had a jeweler or something look at it and the guy said, well, that's been attached. And then when you get over to the counter stamps, the suspension methods are treating it kindly crude. So you can see, and this is part of that whole transitional process that we've been talking about. So there's gonna be, the book's gonna be roughly somewhere around 275 pages. So that's all we have. You have anything you wanna add, Ron? Uh, no, Chad, uh, let's see if I can get back up on the screen. Am I up? Yeah, we can see you. Um, John, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen, um, okay. it'll just make it so everyone can see us nice and big. There you go. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I, um, I, I think that's a, um, uh, a very good representation of, uh, you know, the conclusions that we've, that we've come to, you know, and we, we've tried to base those um, on fact um try to um particularly limit speculation um uh, that is uh, you know not factually based um uh, but just kind of a you know construing what could have happened um you know I, I think um i think that's always important but uh, you can cross the line into historical fiction quite rapidly. Um, so we've really tried to, um, you know, work with fact. I think the other thing that's important is um, to, to dispute the right attribution to the medalettes, for example. Um, the first attribution, uh, in our opinion, was by John McCoy, and this was recorded uh, by Woodward's um, auction of McCoy's estate in 1864. McCoy was one of the most astute, historically astute um, numismatists. Uh, other gentlemen, uh, Joseph Mickley, um, you know, these, these were not just, uh, you know, casual collectors. And I, I think uh, Woodward was pretty early in his career as a, as a cataloger. And um, um, I think probably he learned quite a lot from these very early numismatists. So that attribution to Wright, we think is very well, you know, very well founded. And to try and dispute that, um, you know, uh, conventional wisdom is, is a double-edged sword. Uh, we've tried to look at this very, you know, very carefully to come to our conclusions. And, um, you know, I, I think I think going forward, um, if you carefully read the Kleberg papers, um, uh, Masanti's comments, 
Um, Dave Bowers is, is very, very interesting because in 1993, I mean, Bowers has been interested in the, the metalette and, and the counter stamp since the mid fifties. In 93, Bowers states in, in, uh, in one of his manuscripts, he has convincingly identified, um, you know, the attribution to write based on this unfinished metal that uh, James Snowden had in his book. Um, I, I find that very fascinating because he was um, so intensely convinced, but in 1999, when Kleberg uh, started um, his idea of Joseph Lewis, um, and I think also in 99 is when, uh, when Dave Bowers uh, was introduced to um, Luigi um, Persico, um, um, you know, Bowers seemed to, to go with, uh, with the Kleberg attribution uh, of Joseph Lewis. But he didn't follow up any with Persico, and I think for good reason. Um, the um, uh, the work that Persico did for the U.S. Mint was basically to draft, I think, let's call it just an illustration of what the engraver then would use to actually engrave and, and sync the dies. Um, but I think you know, in Toto, I you know, I I think. Um, you know, uh, Richard Trested, along with his apprentice, I mean, Trested had a very well-established business in London before traveling to America. Um, 1818, 1819, we have records of his establishment um, in London. My guess is maybe that James Bell was an apprentice at that time, travel with him to America. So when Trested arrived in New York, he wasn't a newbie. Um, he was he was well established in in this business, um, and it's interesting because trusted and Wright and uh, and the Duran brothers they're all about the same age, um, so um, they all come from um, quite respectable um, uh, educations as far as engraving um die sinking um and manufacturing i think that's where Treston's role is probably the greatest um he he was very well established by 18 1821 and with cyrus duran ab duran um you know um also uh wright had a very successful business um in Savannah, Georgia, and uh, Charleston, South Carolina, uh, particularly his business in, in the Carolina um, area is well documented through advertisements. Um, when, when Ride moved back to New York, um, uh, there was even an agent in South Carolina that for the remainder of 1824 advertised that if you wanted work done by Charles Cushing Wright, even though he was, you know, back um, in New York, um, this uh, South Carolina business uh, representative would send the work to him so that you could have it done, done by him. So he had quite a reputation uh, uh, in South Carolina. I think also the Pickney Medal was his, his first work um, which was probably done in the 1820, 1821 um, area. And there's actually newspaper advertisements that would, would help um, substantiate that. Um, been a really interesting project, Jack. Jack and I've had quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting time. And uh, we've complimented each other quite nicely um, in terms of agreement, disagreement, and uh, Proving and disproving um, uh, some of some of the facts, so there's been really strength in that. Hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you guys um, for a very interesting presentation. I found it very fascinating. Um, 
and hopefully everyone else did out there. Um, so if you guys have any questions, uh, you can put them in the Q and A. Um, I will go ahead and start asking those now. Um, so put them in as you think of them, and we'll get on with the Q and A. So it looks like we have one here. How did you go about researching such a niche topic, and where did you find your information? Um, <laughs> uh, interesting, interesting uh, beginning. Um, I purchased uh, one of these counter stamps, um, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. And the idea was, um, first of all, I really enjoy large scents. And first counter stamp was, was on a large scent. It was It was Washington and it was Lafayette, two very historical figures. Um, I purchased it with the idea that one of these days I would take a closer look at it. When COVID hit, uh, the, this would, I think, Jack, uh, I think this was January of 2021. I pulled this out of my collection and um, uh, I knew that Jack had had an 1816 large stamp with the counter stamp. Um, uh, I asked him to send me a picture and, and he did. And we noticed some abnormalities in the difference in the strike. We began to ask the simple question, who made the dyes? And that's where things started. Uh, when we did the first research, of course, it, you know, there, there was about 150 years of people saying that Charles Cushion Rye did it. The Kleberg paper was there saying that this guy, John Lewis, did it. Uh, we couldn't find any evidence that John, John Lewis had ever, you know, struck a die or, you know, had the manufacturing technique. I mean, he was he was an incredibly successful um, entrepreneur, a businessman. Uh, and so just uh, one thing led to another. Jack, jump in and and. Well, I think one of the main points and, you know, we use, you know, a lot of new, newspapers dot com. Uh, Ron has a fairly extensive library that we could draw on. Of course, the in it, the Newman portal we used extensively. And it was just digging and you usually you'd find something, then you'd have to go find something else is kind of the way it worked. Work. And I think one of the big things that we hit on kind of a, in the beginning is when we started looking at, uh, at uh, the physical layout of, of Lewis and Treston's uh, uh, businesses is that uh, Lewis had about a thousand square feet and it was full of stuff. He advertised 10,000 articles or some crazy thing of some kind. But when you looked at uh, uh, Trested, he actually appeared to have like about 6,000 square feet of space. So one had, so that immediately got said, well, I wonder, you know, obviously Lewis had nowhere to make them in our opinion, but Trested did. And I think that's probably why he called them. But that's just, you know, so just a lot of digging. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, we have another one. How rare are these pieces um, and how expensive is the typical piece? Well, the, the rarity I think is, I don't think they're quite as rare as people think there are because if you look at all of them that you're gonna say, boy, there's quite a few, but there's still a, like R5, R6 type type stuff if you go by, go by that and uh, the, uh, Oval medallions, like I said, we've only found five of those things. I, we think that that's that they're probably they were made in greater numbers than that, according to the, to what we've read. But uh, I, we think they were probably treated as jewelry and just kind of got thrown in as not really as a numismatic item. Hmm. I think as 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 far as cost, I think the um, um, you know the range for the counter stamps. Um, in the past five or six, 10 years, let's say, is, you know, maybe the, the top number would be around $3,000. Um, the Adelette themselves, I I think um, the Sid Martin was around $8,000. Um, it, um, it, it, it really depends. I mean, they, uh, if, if you look at, if you look at the early auction records, um, collectors had quite a few of these. And then 
and then we went for years and, and there was no appearance in the um in the auctions mm -hmm. you don't have any records of any private transactions um but then maybe i don't know in the 60s 60s and 70s you know we began to see um uh, see appearances um the you know the john ford collection had a couple and um but but jack is correct about the oval medallions um uh, i remember when those things were up for auction last and of course that was that really predated our interest um i i think they sold for under 300 dollars a piece mm -hmm. uh, i wish i had known what i know now <laughs> Because they yeah. are exceedingly rare, exceedingly rare. Okay, awesome. Um, so there are no more questions in the queue currently. Um, so if you have any questions, now's a great time to put them in there. Um, you won't have to wait to hear the answer. Um, but you guys do have a book coming out. Um, do you guys know when that will be out on the market? We we hope to have it available at the AAC convention in May for sale. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So if anyone out there is looking for a wealth of um, information on the topic, uh, you can get excited for that book coming out. Um, and I do not see any more questions. We think it'll be here. a pretty good reference source down the road, whether you agree or disagree with our conclusions. But as far as, yeah. you know, having facts and stuff to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed very thorough um, from the table of contents and all the pictures you guys shared. Um, seems like it'll be, a, yeah, a very thorough good reference book um, for years. Yeah, so there are no more questions. Um, so unless you guys have anything else um, to share, I guess we can wrap up. Yeah, well, we appreciate the audience and the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, we thank you guys for presenting. Um, and for all the viewers, um, we will have more NNP symposium presentations today and tomorrow. Um, I believe the next one starts at two o'clock. Um, so definitely try to tune in for some more of these um, throughout the weekend. But again, John and Ronald, uh, thank you guys so much thank for you. presenting. Thank you. Yep. Bye.